Okay, so we now move on to um, Professor Lankov and Dr. Ward. Um, welling right well behind time. Uh, if you if you want to go to the toilet, stroke, eat, or do anything while I'm talking, I don't care. So don't worry about that. Um, I'm here primarily to listen to the sound of my own voice, not to take your questions. Only kidding, only kidding, only kidding. Um, so um, I'm going to talk for 20 minutes because apparently I have no time. So let us begin. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about, as you can maybe hopefully see, a transition without reform, understanding the political economy of North Korean marketization. Um, I'm writing this book with Andre, who's going to be pushing the buttons. He's the bait and this is the switch so you're all here to see the celebrity in the field who everyone's heard of and everyone wants to meet you know you want to kiss the ring you want him to autograph you or autograph a piece of paper whatever um you've never heard of me and i'm going to give you a presentation he's going to push the buttons so probably i should just be yeah. <laughs> i hope tatiana can't yeah. see us sir. <laughs> okay um so let me run you so i'm now going to do my best impression of the most boring person you've ever seen on tv um so next slide sir um, so North Korea is a remarkably closed and poor country by the standards of the region. Uh, so um, as you probably all know, East Asia is a very dynamic, economically successful, industrially powerful and highly important region in the global political economy. Uh, uh, and it is full of countries, full of a small number of countries, a small number of countries that are e extraordinarily economically successful. North Korea is the exception, I guess, that proves the rule. Um, you know, no matter how... Um, how how um how how would you describe it sir no matter how um well adapted your culture society and economic institutions well not economic institutions in north korea's case but no how well no matter how well adapted your culture and society are to uh modernization if you have bad enough political institutions you can still create hell on earth yeah. uh, economically so speaking you actually can ruin even an east asian economy there we are there we are yeah, yeah. andre talks in slogans for uh journalists um i i ramble like an academic even though he's the academic and i'm his trainee uh but but anyways, so on the surface, we have an, an unreformed uh, Stalinist state with no private firms beyond the household. We have state control over finance, state control over factor markets. So factor markets are markets for land, labor, capital, uh, raw materials, and intermediate goods. Um, and we also have uh, state control over most product markets. So both goods and services for consumers and or other businesses. Um, but in practice, we have uh, North Korea has undergone significant structural change in practice, not legally, but in practice. Um, and informal market practice practices have partially substituted for or compete with Stalinist institutions um, at both the firm level within state-owned enterprises and also within households. Um, so how do we account for this? Um, what, role is the, what role does the state play in these processes of change and how do we account for um, reform what was called reform from below by uh, Marcus Noland and uh, Steph Haggard uh, about 15 years ago, or what you could describe as what we describe as transition without reform. Um, so we utilize ideas and concepts from the political economy of uh, um, comparative authoritarianism uh, and also uh, various ideas from comparative socialist studies uh, and economics and political science and so sociology generally um, and seek to make sense of the North Korean case. Next slide, sir. Hmm. This really looks strange. Anyways, I'll keep talking. Um, so there's a many of you might be familiar with the fact that there is a big debate uh, within uh, political science and economics about how a transition from socialism occurs or should occur. Uh, you have this sort of shock therapy versus gradualist um, argument. Um, now, this this discussion is actually very interesting. There's a lot of talk about how uh, how a transition should or was sequenced, uh, what the appropriate role of the state is in the economy, both as a regulator, as an owner of assets, and as potentially a producer of goods and services. Um, I'm not saying that this isn't an interesting uh, discussion and isn't relevant so far as it goes, but it, most of it doesn't really apply to North Korea. North Korea hasn't really gone through a real process of reform and change. Now, there have been what they call improvement measures. There have been some changes to product markets, for instance, allowing households to engage in more market-like or market like the wrong word market um, market transactions and allow um, state firms to engage in more uh, productive activities where they have more imp have more say over how goods are priced or what kinds of goods are produced um, but nothing uh, that really looks anything like what happened in Eastern Europe in the 19 in the late 80s and early 1990s the former Soviet Union in the late 80s and early 1990s or China in the 1990s that level of reform has not occurred in North Korea so if we talk about the gradualism versus shock therapy uh, discussion um, 
at the official level, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, of course, at the unofficial level, Andre loves to say that North Korea went through all of the neoliberal, uh, mm -hmm. they, they had all of the pain of uh, neoliberal shock therapy without any, of, uh, without any of the official reforms. How would you put it, sir? I would, I would say they had all neoliberal reforms, de facto, and all problems without a single neoliberal in the government and the route. And still with all of the shortages of toilet paper that you have under socialism as well, right? Uh, well, complete disappearance on that stage. Complete disappearance of toilet paper too. Very important point there. Um, so, um, so that's one problem that we would like to stress. Uh, another problem I think it's important to remember is, look, the, um, so the literature on North Korea in Korean is much more developed and much more advanced than, um, than it is in English. If you want to study North Korea, you have to speak Korean. Uh, unless you want to study, I don't know, um, North Korean satellite imagery, which is really important and interesting field. There's some people doing really great work on that. Or, you know, so if you want to study forestry cover in North Korea, it's work that we actually use as well. It's really interesting and important. I recommend, I recommend reading it. Even then, a lot of the people who study North Korean forestry cover speak Korean and do their research in Korean. But um, yeah, unless you want to study something that does not involve any aspect of interacting with their society, reading any of their sources, or talking to North Korean refugees in any way at all, you have to speak Korean. Um, and that's really hard work, and most people don't want to do it. Uh, so yeah, anyways, um, it, unless you're a background speaker, but unfortunately my parents weren't Korean. Anyways, I recommend it. Uh, so the literature on North Korean studies in Korean, uh, so the literature on North Korean economy in Korean is very advanced compared to English. Uh, there is a lot of discussion, there's a lot of debate that surrounds this sort of um, marketization from above versus marketization from below. Uh, you know, do we see, is it primarily, is marketization primarily driven by uh, market actors creating um, farming or creating goods and, and uh, making, uh, you know, offering services in their homes or in the household? Hold, or is it primarily driven, say, by foreign trade companies and North Korean state-owned enterprises um, utilizing resources that they either acquire, steal, or yeah, legally acquire uh, through state channels to develop, to make products and offer services um, in a marketized fashion, in a legal way, or and or is the state an institution builder? Does it build market institutions or not? Um, this is an interesting debate, but it's kind of uh, we kind of sidestep it because we don't um, we don't think that it's actually as meaningful a debate as it once appeared. Rather, we're more interested in, say, the topography of markets in North Korea. So how the distribution of property rights differs across sectors and within sectors. So you have a value chain in, say, the uh, fisheries sector, which begins with extracting fish from the sea, processing them, distributing them, selling them, etc. And the state is involved in different levels of value chain in different ways and to differing extents. And we try and offer basically uh, um, a set of explanations as to why the state would uh, seek to be involved in this part of the value chain or, or not, and then the, or another part of the value chain or not. Um, and our explanations primarily rely on discussion of state capacity, so the state's capacity to penetrate, control, um, and coerce social actors, um, and the political strategies that are pursued by the elite, uh, or rather by the government and the leader himself. Um, and this is where um, comparative authoritarianism, uh, an appreciation of the importance of different kinds of state capacity and the amount of state capacity available, um, as well as, uh, you know, the uh, close focus on uh, the distribution of property rights really comes into its own. And in a lot of ways, like a fair amount of this research in to differing degrees has been done in Korean to some extent, but we're trying to offer a new perspective and bring together a, a set of conceptual tools which we don't think have been fully utilized in either language uh, when tackling dis when discussing marketization in North Korea. Okay, next slide. Um, so what's our unit of analysis? What are we actually focusing on? Um, so we're primarily concerned about transactions um, and access to uh, factors of production. So I, I mentioned them earlier. Some of you probably are in, quite interested in economics, but if you're not, factors of production are things that you use to produce stuff or services, um, so goods or services. This would be land, labor, capital, raw materials, uh, intermediate goods. Uh, you know, so intermediate difference between raw materials and intermediates is kind of a bit hazy. I get kind of a bit hazy about this sometimes, but I guess the difference between, say, coal and steel. Steel is an intermediate 
intermediate good. You don't buy steel in your local shop, right? But you, a lot of steel is going to go into producing most of the things you see around you. This bottle top, this this phone, there's probably some steel in this table. There's going to be steel in the in the in the chairs you're sitting in. It's a very important intermediate good, right? Um, uh, raw materials, I think we I think that's self-explanatory. Land, labor, and capital. Important to remember with capital, there's two kinds of roughly speaking, two kinds of capital. There's capital in the financial sense, um, and then there's capital as in capital goods like that computer or this uh, maybe this microphone um or uh you know the lights in this room uh, capital goods are used in the production of other capital goods or in the production of products for for markets um so why why should you care about this in north korea well factor markets are absolutely crucial to determining the structure um, of production um, and they are dominated in North Korea almost exclusively by the state. Um, and that's very, very important. Um, so that's where we mainly focus our analysis. We examine um, property rights de jure and de facto pertaining to factors of production. So who in actual fact uh, controls um, land, for instance, or who in actual fact is able to mobilize labor? Um, now, property rights can be distinguished in, into, into a basket of three distinct uh, kinds. So you have control or management rights. So, um, for instance, a manager, a manager of an enterprise, a manager of a capitalist firm, so Sasha Nadella, the first person I think of, the CEO of Microsoft, uh, he would have management rights over um, his staff um, at Microsoft. Uh, but he does not have um, necessarily uh, residual income rights. So uh, he gets paid a wage uh, by uh, Microsoft, by the by by the Microsoft, the firm, but he doesn't get to decide how all of the firm's income is spent. He has to liaise with shareholders. He, to, he may have to liaise with his colleagues. He doesn't literally get to uh, decide, um, oh, well, you know, we made $3 billion net profit this year. I'm going to spend it all on a nice yacht for myself. He can't do that. Uh, if if Microsoft was a sole proprietorship and it didn't have any shareholders, maybe he could, uh, minus, you know, after paying taxes. Um, uh, if you have your own uh, independent web company, you make your own websites and stuff, and you earn a profit, uh, and you don't have any shareholders, you can decide how you spend your residual income. You have residual income rights. You also have control rights. You get to control. You probably get to control um, how you use your computer, uh, and you know uh, what you do with your time. But if you work for Microsoft, oh sorry, if you're the CEO of Microsoft, um, you will not have probably um, residual income rights. The other thing, um, uh, the, uh, the third kind of property rights. So we have income rights. We have residual income. Uh, we have income rights, we have uh, control rights or management rights, and then we also have finally transfer rights. So this is the right to uh, buy and sell the assets of your firm. So for instance, Microsoft owns land. Uh, um, uh, Microsoft will own a stock of computers. It will have capital stock. It may have inventory of raw materials, probably not. But you know, other firms will have inventory of raw materials and intermediate goods. Uh, do they get to decide what? The, do they are they allowed to decide on their own whether they can transfer control over their assets, sell their assets, in other words, to another firm or to a household? Now, it, in most capitalist firms, this is the case, right? You know, if if you know if, if Microsoft wanted to sell like a large piece of land, it might need to talk to its shareholders, but it might not need to. It can sell a division. Um, but in North Korea, um, for many of the factors. We're going to, I will talk to you about briefly. I'm probably using up all my time just talking about this. Um, they, um, firms do not have uh, transfer rights in the strict sense. They're not easily able to just go, well, you know, we've got this big piece of land that we want to just sell to the guys down the street. But you can't do that in North Korea. Microsoft may be able to sell land to SOAS, but you know, uh, the state, the state, the state software c company number seven in Nampo, just made that up, uh, would probably not be able to sell, uh, you know, a small piece of land next to, you know, um, uh, next to its, uh, its, what was that? To Kim, Kim Chek University. To Kim Chek University without uh, lots of negotiations with lots of regulators and bureaucrats. Um, they may not, they probably wouldn't also be able to get a market price for it because that would be illegal because there aren't any legal markets for land. There is kind of a sort of de jure mark, uh, semi-market exchange market for the lease of commercial property, but it's very underdeveloped and state uh, state companies don't have pricing rights. Anyways, well, in, in, in practice they do, but in theory they don't. Um, anyways, so the three groups we look at in our analysis are the central government, which I've already touched on briefly, uh, the local entities, so local uh, branches of central government ministries, local branches of the party, local um, enterprises of various kinds, um, and uh, uh, local, uh, let's see if I missed any, uh, local military units. Um, and then um, we uh, and then households themselves, so households, entrepreneurs, who are the drivers of a lot of the change we see, or a lot of the change that we're interested in analyzing. Rather, uh, now marketization is a 
co-productive process. It's not like uh, North Korean. So this is the problem with the capitalism from so marketization from below school. It's this idea that markets are created ex nihilo out of nothing to novo by you know North Korean market actors, and the state is largely there just to get in the way and extract rents. And it's more complicated than that. And maybe I'm parodying the position a little bit, but not, not really, not very much. Um, anyways, so we're interested in these three groups. Once again, central government, local entities, local state entities, state party, military entities of various kinds, and then households or entrepreneurs. Um, and we look at four sectors, four sectors we chose in part because of convenience, if I might be so bold. Uh, but also, we would suggest these four sectors are crucial uh, for the lives of the North Korean people. They may not be particularly crucial for national income, because North Korea produces a lot of monuments, and it also produces a lot of uh, missiles. Um, and as a percentage of national income statistics, there are probably a lot of missiles and monuments, which, mm, yeah, which, which may distort the figures. Uh, but for the average North Korean person, we would argue that private arable farming, private animal husbandry, private fishing, and private household manufacturing and distribution are four crucial sectors for survival. So let me unpack those quickly. Uh, private farming uh, at home or on local mountains uh, is crucial for people to get the food they need to survive. Uh, private animal husbandry, similar, although obviously uh, uh, um, animal protein is, is a luxury good, but nonetheless, you can make money from uh, farming pigs and selling them to market. Uh, private fishing uh, has been crucial. It's been a crucial source of export earnings for the, re export earnings for the regime, but it's also uh, Particularly, uh, it's a, it's a, a labor-intensive industry in which a lot of working-class uh, North Korean men work, for instance, and a lot of North Korean women work as food processors as well. Of course, absolutely. Um, and then finally, private manufacturing and distribution, which is dominated by women, uh, and uh, are absolutely crucial for uh, small, you know, less wealthy North Korean households producing things at home, um, and then distributing through the market system to make, you know, make. Make, make ends meet, as it were. Okay, so um, I think I've actually covered a lot of the concepts um, that we were, we were going to, uh, I was going to uh, talk about, introduce. What I just quickly say is that we're primarily interested in property rights, and we distinguish between different kinds or different levels of um, interaction with the state. So there's this concept in sociology, political science, um, it's not really used in economics, although they do acknowledge it exists, uh, political embeddedness. And this is distinct from social embeddedness. So um, I'll tell you what political embeddedness is, and then I'll briefly describe how it's different from social embeddedness. Um, so political embeddedness is uh, basically relate um, either interpersonal ties uh, or structural relations uh, enmeshed within the state in one way or another, or enmeshed within political context in one way or another. Um, in the sense that we describe, we're talking about market actors involved with the state in various different ways. Uh, when we say the state, I'm talking more about local entities. So if you want to get access to la commercial land in North Korea, you have to go through a local entity. You have to go through a local branch of a government ministry or a local enterprise or a local uh, party uh, committee. Um, uh, and that involves uh, relations of uh, reciprocal dependence. You know, uh, you know, you would have to pay for access. You might work together on a project, etc. You can't just buy land from another individual or another firm and uh, use it um, for commercial purposes. Uh, there are exceptions, and we'll talk about those later. But um, the idea basically is that. Um, the, the it, it's what you could call political capitalism, what it's sometimes called political capitalism in the literature. This idea that um, you beyond the household, you have to go through the state in one form or another, and we term that political embeddedness. I mean, there's other terms you could use, but the term it's it's from sociology and political science, and it's quite wi widely used uh, in the China context and in the context of other many other developing countries. And one of my projects, which Andre is not a huge fan of, uh, is to try and uh, normalize North Korea as a, just another developing country. Uh, a very poor developing country, a very badly run developing country, a very well ordered country, you know, a country that's not very violent. There isn't many, there aren't many ethnic cleavages or other, you know, sources of internecine conflict in North Korea compared to many other developing countries, uh, especially underdeveloped, poor developing countries rather than fast developing countries. Um, but I like to look at North Korea through, say, the lens of uh, another, as a developing country, as it were. Um, uh, Andre uh, and I are uh, we agree to disagree, would you say so? Mm, yeah, not exactly. I agree. It's we should not go too far. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Not nope. for the exotization, but yeah, it's still a very unusual place. Yeah. Um, but you know, so political embeddedness is a is a concept that's used in that context. Now, I, I kind of conceptualize and try to measure it. Well, measure is probably a strong word, but at least um classify um how did I how did I put this? Um, you know, 
classify in relative terms, if not measure directly, because this stuff can't be directly measured, not in North Korea anyway. Um, uh, the level to which uh, households or entrepreneurs are enmeshed, embedded, uh, within state structures uh, in order to access factors of production. So land, labor, capital, raw materials, intermediates, et cetera. Um, and that's what we call embeddedness. Uh, the opposite of embeddedness is autonomy. Uh, so this is, you know, there's a very famous book in development studies called Embedded Autonomy by Peter Evans. Uh, I always thought his name was hilarious. It sounds almost as boring as mine. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, the, this idea that uh, bureaucrats uh, are embedded within society, but they are autonomous from it. And then from it, through their autonomy, they are able to make decisions uh, about uh, development, which allows them to sort of propel a development process, which can lead a country to end up like South Korea. Now, we're not talking about the same process, but, oh, I'm already at 20 minutes. Damn, I'll be quick. Um, but basically North Korean um, entrepreneurs are uh, to, lesser, to a lesser or greater extent embedded within or autonomous from the state. Uh, and that is what we're really focused on. Um, all right, um, now how's that different from social embeddedness? Now, um, I know Professor Gray um, is very interested in, in social embeddedness. Um, I'm also very interested in social embeddedness, but it's kind of a distinct thing. I mean, you could say that political embeddedness is a, a, a special case of social embeddedness, but so um, there's two schools of thought on embedded uh, social embeddedness. You have the sort of Polanyi, uh, Owen will tell me if, if I get this wrong, so please feel free to cut in if I get this wrong. Um, but the idea that basically markets have gradually evolved to become, um, or gradually become Dislodged? Is that, is, that, is that the right word? Um, okay, all right. Um, this, uh, sort of uh, dislodged from uh, social norms and social values. And, uh, you know, we, I mean, Mark Carney talks about this in his recent book, actually, as well. We've increasingly become a market society, and the norms of the market have come to dominate um, other, other you know, normative systems and cultures uh, that exist within society. So increasingly, the value of a person or the value of our labor or the value of who we are is measured by our productivity and our, you know, the, 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 the price of the output we can produce. Um, that's not what we're talking about in North Korea, okay, first of all. Secondly, um, social embeddedness in the sense that Granovitter, in his very famous paper, The Problem of Embeddedness, uh, it talks about... Um, the idea that economic activities do not occur in a social void, but they are structured around networks um, and, nor and the norms of society and ongoing social ties. Uh, and these ongoing social ties can be positive, they can be negative, they have positive or negative consequences, but they're always there. Um, and uh, they can't be avoided. And economic models that do not account for them do not account for the social reality and to lack Explanatory and predictive power is, is the argument. Um, we're not really talking about that either, but, but just wanted to flag that those exist. And when you look up embeddedness on Google, you might come across those. Okay, so what are we talking about? Um, well, I don't have much time, so I'm going to rush along. Um, we use, uh, what, are we, what are our methods first? We primarily use interview data. We also use North Korean satellite imagery. We use um, satellite imagery from North Korea. We use North Korean laws. We use North Korean uh, written sources of other kinds, official sources. Uh, including leaked documents and that kind of stuff as well. Uh, we practice a method that's widely called triangulation in a qualitative uh, social analysis. Uh, so basically we're doing data source triangulation. So you try and bring together as many sources as possible to make sense of a social phenomena. Uh, and this is absolutely crucial in North Korea. I mean, when you study other countries, you might be able to rely on one method um, very well and produce fantastic results. But unfortunately, North Korea really is just not enough sources. So we have to use as many different kinds of sources as possible in order to triangulate what's going on. Um, Okay, argument. So actually, I think I've, I've, I've already gone through quite a lot of the argument, but what I would suggest is what I haven't talked about, uh, which I should definitely talk about now, is that the central government has largely in North Korea been forced since the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, to tolerate, uh, conditionally tolerate, or otherwise known as contain in political science, uh, the spread of market forces. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we don't see blanket repression. We do see occasional, we see continued, but relatively occasional instances of um, repression. Uh, there have been upswings in repression, like in the late 2000s, where both product and factor markets were targeted. Market actors within these spaces, both local entities, uh, or local local um, officials, um, and entrepreneurs uh, were targeted for repression. Uh, but what we 
what we have seen increasingly actually is that the state went through a period of toleration with sporadic repression, then a concerted attempt to roll back markets in the late 2000s, followed by, followed by some institutionalization, some creation of new rules, new institutions, new structures, um, what political scientists sometimes call co-optation, um, but with also continued toleration, conditional toleration. Um, so what that means is that property rights in, in many of the industries that we analyze are not rights. Uh, there has been some attempt to build uh, these sort of build institutions of property rights in ways that we'll talk about in a moment. But in most instances, what has actually happened is you've seen the spread of these sort of customary uh, arrangements mm -hmm. that are they, that are politically embedded, you know, and there are certain there are certain expectations that surround the way people behave when they interact when when entrepreneurs interact with um, local entities or local officials. Uh, but these many of these practices and the relationships uh, are not subject to the law, not directly. I mean, sometimes there's indirect ways you could you can mobilize the law as a resource in your in your fight with whoever it might be but more often than not these relations are primarily about yeah they are primarily about trust and they're about ongoing ties um and the central government is well aware of these kinds of arrangements as in there is a it's often speculated that the central government might not know, uh, may not know the full extent to which markets have spread through society and into the state. But the documentary sources we have been able to acquire indicate the, the state is well aware of what is going on and continues to practice what could be described as forbearance, very um, selective uh, repression um, and toleration. Uh, of markets, given that they, the state ha lacks the capacity to build alternative institutional arrangements and considers alternative institutional arrangements potentially to be more politically destabilizing than to tolerating the status quo. Uh, and that's very different from adopting a set of top-down reforms, either gradually or rapidly, through a process of gradual reform like in China or shock therapy like in the former Soviet Union. It's something very different, in fact. Um, yes, so... But um, how am I doing for time? I really should rush, shouldn't I? You should rush up. Yeah, all right. Um, so uh, this uh, is a picture of a North Korean marketplace. And when you think, when people think of North Korean markets, this is often what they think of. Um, and what's really interesting about this, um, Professor Gray talked about this in his recent book as well, actually. But um, grassroots capitalism, North Korean market actors transacting in a uh, government regulated or partially government regulated space. Um, but engaging in autonomous transactions as uh, as equals uh out, not in in, in transact you know in, 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 we call this partial autonomy right so they might pay a storage fee uh and if they're selling you know meth or pornography then they're going to be arrested but if they're just selling non-illicit commodities they're left to their own devices um but even here uh the state is obviously present as a regulator and as a, an institution builder and maintainer um what's interesting though just, we can, can we go to the next one so what's um what's interesting though is um the state in uh, grassroots markets has sought to build some institutions. So uh, price controls, uh, storage fees, taxes, uh, quite negative from the point of view of uh, from market operators. Infiltration, institutions of infiltration. So, uh, you know, stalls are policed. Uh, people selling outside of the market will be arrested or you know, more, more, probably just fine, to be honest, probably not arrested. Um, but the state is trying to build some institutions. Um, so this is, you know, this is grassroots in the sense that it's um, most people working in markets are not receiving plans from uh, the North Korean equivalent of GOSPLAN, the state planning committee, um, and they are planning their own production, uh, but, and, you know, have their own sales strategies. But this is still not as simple as just, uh, you know, unstructured spontaneous marketization from below, as it were. Um, next slide, sir. Um, beyond, uh, let's rush through all of this, actually. Um, let's go to... Uh, Slide a next one. Yeah. Okay. But beyond uh, beyond the household, we have a scaling problem. So, like I said earlier, land, all land, capital goods, uh, intermediates uh, can only be traded between state-owned enterprises. Uh, land 
um it's a bit more hazy sometimes but not really um if you want to engage in any kind of market activity including distribution that involves anything but using your own bicycle and your own back garden uh producing stuff in your own house you're going to have to interact with local officials in one form or another and i don't mean just bribing them to get them out of your way i mean if you want to acquire more land or say for instance register some trucks uh you can't register them in your own name industrial land you would have to uh you would have to uh use use land owned or and controlled by a local entity of some form or another local entity is in local part of the state in some form or another so this creates a scaling problem um as a result you have these sharing arrangements that take many different forms um between local entities and uh local entrepreneurs um which the state is very well aware of so um let's go to the next slide so here's a few examples for you um Larger, we the, the industries in which we largely focus are, you know, so I mentioned earlier. So in those industries, there are many outside of those industries as well. But in those industries, you'd have larger pig farms. So people can produce a lot of pigs in their own back garden. I was very surprised at how many pigs you can fit in a North Korean back garden. A lot. You can keep them at the home as well, where you're growing, while while you're waiting for them to reach. Wait, do people keep li uh, like? Adult pigs in their in their homes as yes. well, right? Yeah. In the kitchen, and my question was, how does it smell? Terrible, but it smells of money. <laughs> oh. Money smells terrible, didn't you know? You can actually buy money cologne. There's a company in America that sells money cologne. Um, but uh, it doesn't smell like pigs. But uh, yeah, so larger fishing farm, uh, sorry, larger pig farms or fishing farms, uh, you would have to um, you would have to acquire some arable, you'd have to acquire some land in which to keep your pigs. Um, you would probably have to work with a local company of some sort or another, and you would enter into some kind of profit sharing arrangement. And that's that's going that could potentially be quite complex. You might also want to you may need to enter into some kind of arrangement where when it comes to sharing expenses related to the workers who they might lend you or the workers who th they have to put on payroll so you can have these workers do the you know help you with pig farming as it were and these kinds of very complex these arrangements can rapidly become very complicated but because north korea has no system of private property rights outside of the household there is no alternative as margaret thatcher would say but the it's the same kind of thing you see in fishing as well um and what we're trying to get at within our analysis is why uh, how these arrangements come into existence how people um are able to pursue private commerce within within their own homes in spite of the fact that they don't have any right to access many of the factors that they need uh, in order to produce what they want to produce and how when they leave their house when they leave the house and they want to build something bigger how they do it um okay um I'll just quickly note the existence of an interesting exception, and I'm going to leave it there. Um, hopefully, my ramblings will have whetted your appetite for more discussion. Um, so one really interesting exception is sloping field agriculture. Now, I'm, I, there aren't that many mountains in England, um, and I'm pretty sure Ben Nevis hasn't been turned into a cabbage patch. But in North Korea, if you North Korea is a very mountainous country, 70% mountains. Yep, seventy percent mountains. Like, roughly, roughly. Yeah. it's a very mountainous country. Um, the food supply is obviously, shall we say, fragile at best, um, and a lot of North Koreans uh, live near mountains. And what do they do? Uh, what did they start doing in the nineteen nineties? Well, started earlier than that. But what do they increasingly in large numbers start to do in the nineteen nineties? Go up into the mountains, cut down the trees, and farm. This is all illegal um and it's not really very embedded either so local forestry officials are not really involved in this occasionally you have to be bribed to go away but you know if you have to bribe a policeman it doesn't mean that you're using the policeman's back garden to do you know to to make to produce cabbages um this stuff is basically what we describe as disembedded and there are other examples of this which are really interesting uh, but i don't have any time to talk to you about it but we have these sort of disembedded factor markets so there are some workers who are for whatever reason are legally supposed to be working working in inside a factory but are not um and are participating in a disembedded labor market we have disembedded land markets like sloping fields where um the sloping field operator could potentially sell they can transfer rights de facto rights obviously not real right not de jure rights but transfer rights to the field that they're farming uh they have the right to residual income over the what they produce in that field um and they also control the field even though they are not embedded within any state entity um 
And the really interesting thing about sloping agriculture is it's really, really important for the food supply in the country. Uh, but the government seems to have been unable um, and largely most of the time unwilling to seriously police it. Uh, there have been multiple eradication campaigns, but largely the government has continued to practice what could be described as toleration or benign neglect, if you want to use a less um, technical expression. Um, and one of the major reasons seems to be a lack of state capacity. And this is something that we keep coming back to in our work, actually. And just I suppose I can wrap up with this point. Um, North, the North Korean state is very, very notionally powerful. The leader has very few checks, very few constraints on his power. Uh, state officials in, in big government ministries and in state security, in the police service, etc., are very unconstrained by the niceties of, you know, regulatory compliance and all of those incredibly uh, complicated, annoying aspects of running a modern government in the developed country. Um, and yet, they lack the capacity uh, and the ability to control many things which we would imagine they would want to get rid of. Um, and as a result, we see these complex patterns of shared de facto property rights between the household and local entities and a state that is largely a spectator um, with some important exceptions and at certain times, but largely we would su suggest it's largely a spectator to what is going on. Anyways, I'm gonna leave it there and uh, yeah, let's let's continue. So we have discussant now, uh, Professor Yoram Golodsky from University of Manchester. Okay, well, let me begin by thanking Andre and, and Peter for uh, inviting me to discuss their work and opening up the fascinating case of, of North Korea, uh, a country whose history um, I had hitherto known relatively little about. Uh, I want to start by restating the main points of their argument, um, as I see it, uh, and then go on to set out three themes, which from a comparative perspective may be um, further developed. So uh, uh, on the surface, North Korea appears to have a classic centrally managed economy without any private enterprise beyond the, the household. However, if we peer more closely, we see that although the state does not recognize markets or private enterprise, nor has it built market supporting institutions, such as a commercial court system, financial markets, or a corporate registry, um, the system has become heavily reliant on de facto markets and private enterprise. The result is that it is not the state's policymakers, but entrepreneurs who are making strategic policy decisions, including those related to, to firm creation. So Peter and Andre ask, how and why can a market economy emerge in a country with a strong state that is implacably opposed to capitalism and markets? How can a transition happen without the conscious policy design or blessing of the state? While other scholars have provided a partial picture of this phenomenon, with some pointing to the role of um, grassroots initiatives and market trainers um, spontaneously creating markets and others have highlighted top-down institution building. Andre and Peter provide a comparative analysis of four sectors to provide a broader and more comprehensive account of the, the overall process. They do this by develop, delving into the property rights literature and disaggregating forms of control into three areas, the, the rights of, of transfer or alienation or sale, management rights, sometimes referred to as use rights, and the right to derive an, an income from property. So there, these are three different sets of, of property rights, which are a, a general right across the property rights literature, which is highly developed um, in, the, in, in the literature. In general, they show that whereas management rights are still mediated through the state, income and transfer rights are now often held by market actors. And using these tools, they aim to provide a more nuanced understanding of what has in effect been a de facto transition to a market economy um, in, in North Korea. 
So this is a, a careful and intuitively attractive analysis that throws up a number of fruitful insights, which I, which can help place the North Korean case in, in comparative perspective. But at the same time, I think if viewed from a comparative perspective, there are, there are three areas that, that Andre and Peter might want to consider developing. Mm -hmm. The first is to do with the role of the state and of political leadership. What is it that is really unusual about the North Korean case? Is it that there is a de facto private enterprise and de facto markets that are not formally recognized by the state? Or, or is it the state has so doggedly persisted in maintaining its classic Leninist form and ideology, avoiding even the so-called market Leninism of China and, and Vietnam? It may be that what is really interesting here is not so much that economy has marketized, but the state has, despite major, major changes in the world around it, retained its basic shape. From the perspective of 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we see that there are other states, such as Russia itself, which have experienced stabilization and liberalization, but where the state has, through a process of incremental de facto renationalization, reasserted control of energy, utilities, the media, and large-scale industry. States such as Russia have fully renounced the Leninist model, while the market Leninist states have arrived at a strange fusion of Leninist, nationalist, and market ideologies. Yet despite major upheavals, such as the famine of the 1990s, the North Korean state has, re has retained the same structure. Now, on page 13, um, Andre and Peter write that the basic aim of all dictators is survival, but I really do wonder whether that is true. In the late 1940s, Stalin invested heavily in um, what would, um, in plans that would only come to fruition long after he had died. This had nothing to do with his survival, but had everything to do with his ideology. In North Korea, vertically integrated hierarchies began to break down in the 1990s and marketized operations emerged within them. The difference with other transition economies was this was not the consequence of specific policy decisions made by the country's leaders, but as uh, Peter and Andre Wright, of the leader's refusal to act in the face of dramatically changed external circumstances. But this surely is the key question. Why did they refuse to act? Why was it the North Korean government tolerated markets of a certain scale and size in the 1990s, only for Kim Il-jung to change his mind in the 2000s and to view markets as a threat to the party state's hegemony? It is difficult to make sense of all this without taking due account of the state's ideology, but that plays only a marginal role in their account. The second, um, it's important that we don't forget that there were markets of a sort in traditional state socialist regimes. The most notable were the farmers markets, which were tolerated in the heyday of Stalinism and whose prices were widely used by economic historians such as R.W. Davis and Alec Nove as proxies for the avail availability of food, and even as very rough measures for levels of welfare. We know from Julie Hessler's work that in the post-war period in the Soviet Union, there were powerful moves to recognize certain forms of private enterprise. There was a, a big debate about this in 1946, 1947, 1948 in the Soviet Union. From Oleg Levniuk's very recent book on Ivan Pavlenka, we also know that there were even self-made millionaires who created and invested in their own firms with very high turnovers, which transacted with other large firms and ministries in Moscow. In the classic Soviet system, we also had entrepreneurs, the Telkachi, who scoured the Soviet Union, sourcing raw materials and shortage goods for their factories. Their activities have traditionally been framed as trust-based network transactions, but if different entrepreneurs were competing for the same goods, they may have had to pay a higher rate, thereby introducing a price mechanism of sorts. 
This is, of course, not to say that the system in North Korea resembles the classic centrally managed economy, but we need to be mindful of what is substantially different here. Mm. And it may be the existence of factor markets, land in particular, um, and this, I think, came out in, in Peter's kind of very sort of last slide when he talked um, about the, the arable market. Um, land in particular could not be uh, bought and sold in classic Leninist regimes and the right in, to create and invest in firms. I think it would be useful um, if we have a framework that can make sense of various forms of slip, slippage and evolution, as well as transformation in all centrally managed economies. So to have a, a broader framework that doesn't just look at North Korea now, but looks at the evolution of centrally managed economies over the, over the whole period of their, of their existence. Third and finally, the four examples that Peter and Andre have chosen are one such as arable farming, animal husbandry, fisheries, and household manufactures, which are central to the survival of the North Korean household and where economic and political entry barriers are relatively low. But in order to press home their point about how a transition can happen without the conscious policy design or blessing of the state, it might be beneficial to widen the variance of case studies to include capital goods, where given their strategic importance to the state, entrepreneurship and active markets might be more surprising. So I'd like to conclude by saying that I found this uh, a fascinating paper and I look forward to, to reading the book. Thank you. Which of you would like to? Yeah, uh, I think yeah. So you you start with ideology if you want. Yes, I thought about it. Now this is a this is a live discussion between us actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, because of the ideology, uh, yes, I think that uh, first of all, in, I'm increasingly beginning for well, uh, personally until recently, I used to think for quite a long time that ideology, with one important exception, ceased to be relevant for the North Korean decision making. That it's a kind of smoke screen for the public. And that the real decision makers, they have one ideology, which is, I would say, North Korean, it's important, North Korean nationalism. Uh, so these people are really committed to the sub long term survival of the North Korean state, not Korean state, North Korean state. Uh, a unification, if it ever happens, is seen as a nice kind of bonus. But now I'm beginning to have some uh, doubts about it because we have more access to the internal documents. And I'm beginning to suspect that at least the older generation, actually we, I say I have to say plural because it's what we were talking with Peter Belief last time yesterday morning, uh, but uh, that uh, we are beginning to suspect that probably at least people of older generation, which still dominate the government. Let's not forget that Kim Jong-un is young and he is basically even showing off his daughter as a probably not necessarily next successor, uh, but most of the people are in their 70s in the government. So these people still uh, have some commitment to the traditional so, so, uh, kind of Leninist state socialist system. They really believe that it's superior politically, morally, whichever. And they see all these problems, all these uh, compromises they have to do uh, as a kind of way to make through to survive difficult times. It's yeah. a kind of ad hoc emergency measure. Again, again, I would say let's not overestimate it. Because these people care about survival of their state, their own legacy. They believe that they are fighting a just war against the evil outside world, which is as bad as they are or worse. Uh, but I think that some of them still have this, indeed some additional kind of more traditional Marxist, Leninist, left wing, or atheist, state center, name it how you like, uh, some kind of such inclination. Yeah. Um, on on markets uh, more generally, especially this uh, idea of a framework for slippage, it's something we've uh, 
we struggled with because we can identify, I would say, relatively coarse grained tendencies in government policy, but we don't have the kinds of um, documentary sources we would like to make more sense of uh, day to day decision making, for instance. Um, you know, as in if you want to know what the government is doing here, then just open the papers, right? But, you know, in North Korea, like um, high, high level discussions, frank discussions about actual policy rather than very vague discussions, um, vague um, slogans um, are very difficult to obtain. Um, information about. Um, so with respect to the 1990s, especially, like uh, we tried, we experimented with using this sort of a uh, framework on uh, historical institutionalist framework for sort of identifying different ch change processes and uh, the extent to which, say, government policy relative to um, institution building from below through like what's sometimes called drift um, were present in these in these different markets. But what we found is it was very difficult to um, we, we couldn't obviously uh, do probability samples and surveys in North Korea, and we didn't have access to the kinds of reports and documents that would be necessary to really reconstruct a chronology at that level of detail that would allow us to really account for uh, institution institutional change, micro level institutional change in, you know, relatively in real time. So it's an approach I'd really like to do. I, I really I have a great deal of appreciation for what historical institutionalists do. But North Korea would probably be one of the least ideal cases in which to do it, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, I think it would be much easier to do in, in the Soviet Union of the late 80s or China of the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Could I just start? I don't want to kind of hog the, the conversation at all, but um, just one just a brief response to, to Andrea's comment. I, I think when you're looking at ideology, it, I think it's important to recognize that in particular when you apply the concept to state socialist regimes that ideologies just doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a, a con cognitive understanding it does, you don't have to mm. believe in the ideology um so there is a lot of work on ideology as a as a kind of discourse discursive formation that consists of various conventions um that, that people adhere to so in the soviet union in the 1970s very few leaders actually believed um in the in the ideology but they adhered to the to the discourse and the framework um of of the ideology and i think that that if you if you adopted that framework then i think that could actually be very very interesting yeah. in the in the north korean case mm -hmm. but it's it's quite it's quite a specific understanding of, of ideology and it's one that i think has probably been used most helpfully um in the comparative analysis of, of leninist regimes i'm usually thinking yeah. about idiocratic regimes um is that is that kind of an approach you're you're, you're talking about as well or um, well, that that might be a, a little bit different, but there is a there is a general framework for the understanding of ideology that has been applied to state socialist regimes. It, it could be um, applied to other um, authoritarian regimes, possibly idiocratic regimes, but there might be much less work on on that. Um, with respect to your final point, um, I really like I really like this idea actually widening the variance uh, uh, of sectors we analyze to include capital goods um what do you think sir want to write another chapter no <laughs> i think i think there's easily an article there uh, one of the major problems we are likely to encounter uh with the exception of some leaked documents and official uh, basically works of kim uh kim jong -il and kim jong -il will help a bit was some leaked documents but information it's Basically, it's uh, what is dealing with North Korea. We always have some areas which are relatively well known and areas which are unknown. And sometimes you have not just temptation, but no choice, but to search behind just, well, where it's not dark. Because in darkness, you will be unable to find. I also see the reason why you would propose this, at least maybe maybe I'm wrong here, but my understanding would be that a capital goods manufacturer is, it requires a level of complexity in the supply chain that you're not going to see with, you know, say, for instance, the production of uh, corn on the side of a mountain. Um, the, the issue with North Korea, obviously, is they don't produce many capital goods. And for most of the period we're talking about, they were probably not producing many machine tools. They were primarily importing them. So it would be an analysis of trade relations, largely. I mean, obviously, you've got this whole move towards CNC that computer in America controls 
that they've been heralding since the late 2000s. And they do assemble some things now. They assemble smartphones and tablets, but they don't actually produce the circuit boards. Um, so, like, in theory, it would be a brilliant idea. In practice, I think it would end up just talking about external relations, and, which is very interesting, but it's not. Yeah. And another part of the problem, the capital goods they produce, uh, they are very often related to the military, or they do it sure. in sure. violation of the sanctions. So getting this stuff probably should go to Tyson Corner, or also known as Lampley. Maybe they know something, but they would not overestimate them. I can't imagine they're interested in property rights within the munitions sectors. Absolutely. I hope they are. I look forward to reading those reports in 30 years' time, but I probably not. No, seriously, it's, uh, first of all, it's relatively small scale because, well, they basically all, most of their equipment is imported from overwhelmingly China. Uh, but and second, what little they produce, it's seen by them as highly sensitive stuff. We managed to get acquire some classified stuff on non kind of non military uh, industries, but here it's sensitive. I I don't think we will be able to get much. Yeah. Okay, I'm afraid I'm going to take a rather probably unpopular decision that we should actually conclude here. Um, because we really, really are running out of time, and we've had actually a very interesting discussion, I think. I would like to start the next bit at uh, midday so that we do actually finish and be able to have some lunch, and we have a couple of minutes breather. I hope I don't have terrible objections for being so uh, tyrannical in my chairing, but um, thank you very much for the, for the panellists and for our uh, discussion.